I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to Einstead. My name is Jordy Elkins. I'm the operations director here, and we are thrilled to have you. Uh, this is a little bit of an experiment for us because we haven't done a Thursday evening program. Um, but as you can see, we've got a full house, and so we're really happy to have you. Um, when the town of Reading uh, announced that they were celebrating Sester Centennial, which I can't say that word enough, um, but the 250th anniversary of Reading, they asked all of the organizations in town to participate in some way that aligns with your mission, not uh, you know, go and develop a whole new program, but find a way that really fits in with what you do naturally. And so, uh, obviously, Highstead, for those of you who haven't been here, we are a, um, a woodland conservation and research nonprofit. So for us to talk about the woods is totally natural and to tie it into the history of the woods and the history of uh, southwestern Connecticut seemed a really good fit for um, celebrating our 250th anniversary here in Reading. Uh, so we're really happy to have you here. Uh, we don't normally put out um, little surveys on the seats but because this was an experiment, we wanted to really find out um, what, what works for people. Our goal is to really provide uh, quality educational programs that are interesting and uh, inspiring, that really get people outside and involved uh, with the natural wonders that are here in Connecticut, but also use that as sort of a lead-in towards um, appreciating the environment and eventually moving towards uh, taking action that really um, helps to preserve and conserve our environment. Um, so I'm going to point out a few things. Uh, right now, if you look around at the walls, we have an exhibit here from the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. It will be up through uh, the end of October. And this is the 20th year that we've uh, hosted an exhibit uh, with that organization. So this year that they honored us and sort of that legacy and the theme is based on Eistead. So some of the uh, paintings and drawings are actually of Eistead. The other uh, birds and animals and, and plants are all found here on the property, if not actually, um, uh, if they weren't actually uh, composed here on the property. So take a look afterwards, or you're welcome to come back. We're open Monday through Friday, so you can call and, and come visit, and you're welcome to come uh, enjoy the art. Um, a second thing I'll point out is we have a newly released uh, conservation report that just came out a few weeks ago. You may have seen it in our uh, e-news uh, called Wildlands and Woodlands, Farmlands and Communities, and it's really um, a group effort that a number of staff here at Highstead and also other uh, authors from Harvard Forest and other organizations around New England have collaborated to really take a look at the New England landscape and paint a picture of what the future could look like and how we can achieve uh, certain conservation goals. So we have full uh, copies, you're welcome to take one. Um, we also have the cliff notes, if you just want to look at the four to six page, you're welcome to take a summary. Um, but they're on the table and, and uh, they're totally available to take. Uh, so now we're going to get to what you all came for, which is um, sort of the, the walk through time and, and the look at the history of the, the landscape. Um, so we have, we have uh, Wyatt Oswald, who's an associate professor at Emerson College. He's also uh, a research fellow at, at the Harvard Forest, and he studies um, the climate change and impacts on ecosystems, and really looks at that through what's a fascinating process of um, taking core samples out of lakes and analyzing the pollen and, and sort of sleuthing uh, what the past looks like. So it's uh, really fascinating work. Um, Ed Faison is our senior ecologist. He's been here since 2007, and he specializes um, in 
deer and moose studies here on the property, but also uh, in other parts of New England as well. He also looks at long-term forest change, and he is really excellent at taking um, complicated science and sort of turning it into user-friendly information. So he writes for um, numerous uh, more popular type uh, science journals and sort of distills complicated <coughs> ideas into easy to understand and digest uh, concepts. So we're going to uh, enjoy the talk from sort of a tag team, uh, first with Wyatt and then Ed. So thank you, guys. Um, Good evening. It's nice to see um, you all out. Thank you for coming. Uh, I want to thank Heisted for hosting the talks tonight. Um, and thank my, uh, my colleague Ed for inviting me to join him in, this, in these talks. Um, the, the way that we've structured things is that I'm going to talk for about a half an hour about uh, the way that forests in New England, including here in the Reading area, change over really long time scales, looking back over 15,000 years of the history of these landscapes. I'm going to need to talk for about half an hour or so, at which point I will pass things off to Ed, who will pick things up and look at the last few centuries, a period of time for which we have much more detail about the way that forests have changed. Uh, I'm going to uh, split my part of the talk into two sections. I'll, I'll first talk about how we use these um, pollen records from late sediment cores to reconstruct uh, the history of, of New England forests going back to essentially since the glaciers were treated. Uh, and then the second part of my talk will be thinking about the, the impacts that people have on the environment and vice versa. And specifically, we'll take a look at um, what we've learned about the history of fire in the uh, forest as well. Uh, I want to start out with a bit of methodology. How is it that we're able to understand what the composition of the forest was like 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago? Um, <laughs> I oftentimes use this slide to try and give you a sense of why we do what we do. Um, and one way to think about this is that trying to understand a film, if you've only seen a single frame, is almost impossible. You have no sense of what's happened in the film up to this point. You have no sense of who these characters are. Are they related to one another? What's with the ray guns? What's with her hair? Um, <laughs> nor do you know where the story is going. You don't have any sense of anticipating the, the, the plot as it will play out. In a sense, the same is true for these ecosystems that we walk around in. Without having a long-term perspective on what has happened over hundreds or even thousands of years, it's hard to have a sense of what's going on in these places, how do we best manage them, and how do we think about the, the future changes that will take place um, in the coming decades, centuries, and thousands of years. In my work, I take advantage of the fact that over time, lakes and ponds fill up with mud, such that if you go, let me see if my pointer's going to work, down in the mud, you're going back in time. And again, in New England, many lakes and ponds have been filling up with sediment since shortly after the glaciers left. So the, the records that I'll be showing you today go back um, 10 or, in some cases, even 15,000 years into the past. We collect a core of the sediment at the bottom of the pond, um, and then take it back to the laboratory, um, and subject the core sediment to all sorts of different analyses. We use radiocarbon dating to figure out the relationship between the depth of the sediment and its age. So in this particular example, which is from a, one of our quarries on Cape Cod, the um, sediment was about um, eight and a half meters in length. Um, and think about that. That's you know, 25 feet of sediment that's accumulated over, over uh, about 15,000 years. So each of these dots represents a, um, a depth at which we have uh, obtained a radiocarbon state. So we know, for example, that the sediment at about uh, two and a half meters is about 3,000 years old. Um, we can extrapolate between the dates um, with this sort of sausage diagram showing us the level of uncertainty at different depths. But overall, this gives us a sense of the relationship between the, the depth of the sediment and how old it is. Um, my own esoteric specialty is identifying pollen grains preserved in the sediment. 
And the idea is that the vegetation surrounding the lake through time is producing pollen grains. Some of those pollen grains are going to end up in the water and get incorporated into the sediment, where they are preserved for thousands of years until I come along with my pouring device and happen to um, end up with them coming back to the lab with me. Um, at different depths in the sediment, we'll take a um, subsample, subject it to all sorts of nasty chemicals, acid and base washes and sieving steps, to the point where all that's left, or most of what's left, is pollen grains, which are made out of this remarkable material that can withstand pretty much anything that you can subject it to in a, in a laboratory. Um, we then make micro microscope slides, um, turn on the great Grateful Dead tapes, and scan up and down the microscope slides <laughs> identifying these pollen grains. Um, for me, it's the Grateful Dead. I don't know if uh, you were listening. <laughs> um, based on the size and shape and ornamentation of the pollen grains, we can identify them sometimes to the family level, sometimes to the genus level, and if we're truly fortunate, sometimes to the species level. Um, I, I won't show, show off in a, in a by all of these for you, but let me just give you a sense of the kind of things we look for. Um, this one this one that looks kind of like a Mickey Mouse head. This is uh, from pine. This one that has a single pore, that's a grass pollen grain. Um, this one is hemlock that has a big fringe around, around the outside and so on. So um, af after doing this for a few years, you get to know a few dozen or maybe even more different types of um, plants through their pollen. These are what the data look like after you've uh, counted hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of pollen grains. Um, typically, at a given depth, you will count a few hundred pollen grains as a, as a subsample. Um, in, this, in this diagram, the y-axis is time, so starting around 14,000 years ago and coming up to the present day. By the way, these are data from a site called Nautilus Pond, which is located in northern Vermont. In this case, the x-axis is the relative abundance of spruce pollen. So in other words, say I counted 300 pollen grains at this particular level. If, um, say I counted 100 pollen grains, say 30 of them were of spruce, that means that the percentage value for spruce would be, would be 30. So um, this gives you a sense of how spruce has come and gone um, in the forest surrounding this particular place through time. Um, of course, we identify other species as well. Um, and here I've added to the plot the, um, the pollen percentages of pine, birch, beech, and hemlock. Um, this is the, the typical sequence that you see in, in northern New England, spruce forests, um, followed by white pine. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, this is, this is uh, so followed by pine, especially white pine. Um, you see hemlock and birch coming in around nine or 8,000 years ago. Um, followed shortly thereafter by a beach. Um, these analyses have been carried out now at dozens of sites across New England by, uh, by the lab that I work in and by other labs at other um, colleges and universities. Um, it's such that we can, not, we can look not only at data from a single site, but we can look at data from lots of sites to try and understand how things are changing both through time and across space. So as an example, um, here is something of a um, a transect of sites going from northern Vermont to north central Massachusetts, close to the Harvard Forest, south central Massachusetts, and trying to make Cape Cod. In each of these cases, I'm showing you um, the, the changes in the abundance of hemlock pollen through time. Um, if you sort of squint your eyes, you see, see that there are both similarities, and that hemlock shows up at about the same time in all of these records around 10,000 years ago. It's relatively high for a while. It experiences a um, abrupt decline, um, is low in abundance for a couple of thousand years, and then has been um, fairly abundant over the last two or three thousand years. There are also some subtle differences between these sites, which, which we're also interested in. Um, I'm not going to say more about the hemlock decline now, although it's one of the things that I've spent most of my time studying over the last 10 or 15 uh, uh, years. Um, but we may come back to that eventually, as it's a, it's a um, really interesting topic. Um, this is the um, data set that, uh, that we've put together um, over the last decade. So each of these dots represents a location where a lake sediment core has been collected and analyzed for pollen 
charcoal and other um, uh, ways of reconstructing past climate. Um, so I'm going to show you a handful of slides now in which we have um, synthesized the pollen data in a map form so you can visualize the way that the abundance of different species changes through time and across space. So um, I'm going to show you a series of these slides which show these little bubble maps. And um, this one is for spruce. Uh, each of the dots, is, again, is one of these sites where we've collected and analyzed the lake sediment core. Uh, and then the relative size of the dot tells you um, the pollen percentage value. So in other words, large dots mean that spruce was more abundant at that place at that time. And then finally, the panels uh, go from old to young, starting in the buttons are on, starting in the upper left at 14,000 years ago, and going through time from your left to your right and from top to bottom, bringing us up into modern the lower right. So for spruce, it uh, its heyday was during what we refer to as the late glacial period. This is uh, between 14 and 12,000 years ago. Climate is still relatively cold, and this is something like the boreal forest that you would find if you were to go, um, you know, 1,000, 1,500 miles north of Canada. Uh, spruce, as I mentioned before, is replaced around uh, 10 or 11,000 years ago by white pine. Uh, white pine is present on the landscape ever since then, but it is, it is particularly abundant between around 11 and 9,000 years ago. Um, I'll also point out that, that modern-day values are, are relatively high, um, primarily because white pine thrived in, after the abandonment of uh, farm fields in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I'll flip, flip through a few more of these quickly just to give you a sense of the different patterns that different species have during the post-glacial period. So this is oak. Uh, there wasn't much oak prior to about 11,000 years ago, uh, but it has done very well since then <coughs> until the present day, especially in southern parts of New England. Um, this is hemlock again. Hemlock comes in around 10,000 years ago. Um, it's it's a little harder to see in this form, but um, but at 5,000 years ago it does have five and 4,000 years ago it does have low values of many of these sites. This was originally um, thought of as uh, the the demise of hemlock populations in response to a, a disease or insect outbreak. At this point, we have fairly compelling evidence suggesting that it was actually the climate that caused these changes in hemlock abundance. Mm -hmm. uh, this is beech. Um, beech comes in, depending on where you are in, in southern New England, around uh, nine or 8,000 years ago. This is hickory. Uh, hickory is late to the game. Um, and one of the most interesting things about this sort of visual visualization of the data is that species that we think of as co-occurring haven't always done so. So hickory oak is a, is a common um, combination of species that you see together. Hemlock and beech oftentimes co-occur today. But as you look back over 10,000 years or so, you find that that isn't necessarily always the case. So two take-home messages from this sort of quick tour of the uh, forest history of New England over the last 15,000 years. Um, if you do the math and figure out how quickly these species are coming back to New England from the, the refugium that they spent the, the last glacial period in, in the southeastern United States, they're moving pretty, pretty quickly. So the rates of migration are, are fast and faster than we, would, than we would actually expect just based on the modern day seed dispersal biology of these species. If you, if you just go out and measure how far um, seeds are dispersed from year to year to year, um, you don't actually get these rates of migration. So it suggests that um, long-distance occasional dispersal events end up being really important. And then secondly, this point that I was just making, species respond individualistically. We oftentimes talk about forest communities or forest assemblages or assemblages of different tree or plant species. But when you look back in time, what you find is that these groups of species that are sort of familiar to us are actually pretty ephemeral, and that they um, that species uh, combine themselves in different ways under different um, environmental circumstances, and and that's certainly to be, be the case going forward as well. Um, I want to segue now to the second part of my part of the talk, which is to think about human environment interactions. That is the way that humans have affected ecosystems <coughs> in the world, um, over these same time scales. 
as well as uh, the way that humans have responded to environmental change. Uh, there are lots of ways in which uh, Native Americans would have had impacts on, um, on ecosystems, um, from hunting to making, taking advantage of coastal resources, um, growing, uh, growing maize, um, promoting mass species like oak and beech, which produce nuts, but it, which would have provided a food source, uh, and, and burning as well. I want to um, use as, as uh, something of a framework for thinking about this a couple of quotes that come from a, from a um, fascinating article by, um, by um, Abrams and Nowacki, which was published uh, almost 10 years ago. And I'll, I'll, I'll read this quote for you, which has to do with um, indigenous agriculture. During the latter part of the Holocene, the Holocene is the last 10 or 11,000 years, Native Americans planted a wide variety of crop species in well-managed agricultural fields adjacent to their village. And one um, piece of evidence is this uh, image shown in the lower right here, which is a map of what would become Plymouth Plantation made by the Champlain Expedition in the 1600s. Um, if this is accurate, this colors the way that we think about modern day conservation. That is, if Native Americans were actively farming and creating open land habitats, um, that may be something that we want to use as a restoration target. So one thing we can do to sort of test that hypothesis is bring these paleoecological data to bear on understanding this, um, as well as archaeological data. And so this is a, an archaeological <coughs> data set that I'm going to use in a, in a handful of slides. So let me take the time now to, to explain this. Um, in this case, the x-axis is time, going from 10,000 years ago to the present day. Um, the y-axis is essentially an index of human population size, Native American population size. This is reconstructed, this is the, the uh, work of a uh, uh, researcher named Sam Munoz, which was um, published in 2010. And um, the group that he was working in uses radiocarbon dates on archaeological materials to essentially come up with an estimate of the relative abundance of Native Americans in, in uh, the northeastern region. Um, so keep in mind that this is a, a regional scale data set and that it's based on a particular type of, of, of measurement. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is that when you reconstruct uh, human population in, in this way, there are a couple of, of clear peaks. This one, between about five and 4,000 years ago, is referred to by archaeologists as the late, late archaic period. And then um, there's one centered on about 1,000 years ago, which is referred to as the late one. So the hypothesis would be that if these are two periods of time when human populations are high, then pollen evidence of either crop species or other indicators of open land agricultural environments would also be high at those times. Uh, are you ready for the big reveal? Okay, so here's, here's one example. This is a data set from a place called Blood Pond, which is in south central Massachusetts. And um, it doesn't look at all like what you would expect if, if Native Americans were having sort of a heavy handed impact on. In the environment through agricultural activities. So uh, I'm showing you in, the, in this upper panel the relative abundance of ragweed pollen. So this is the same ragweed that may give you hay fever in the um, summer and fall. Um, ragweed is a common weedy species on the edges of fields and that sort of thing. Um, and you can see that it clearly increases in abundance at the time of European settlement. Um, so if you go back a thousand years to when um, Late woodland populations were high, no peak. If you go back four or five thousand years ago to late archaic time, no peak. There's only a peak of, at about um, eight to ten thousand years ago, which, as I'll talk about momentarily, is a period of dry climate. Um, and, it, uh, and our interpretation of this, which um, which was actually published by by um, in, in a paper in which Ed was the first author in 2006, um, we interpret this as, as dry climate, and relatively open forest conditions. This is um, consistent with other types of archaeological data. And this is a figure that comes from um, uh, a book written, uh, published this, this year by Dave Foster, who's one of our collaborators at the Harvard Forest. Um, this is a terrific book called The Meaning of Land and Sea, which is about um, essentially the history of, um, of uh, forests and human activities on, on Martin's vineyard. So these are um, 
this is, these are data from an arc, from a sort of survey of archaeological data from across the coastal region. And just to orient you on this, this sort of funny map, it goes from, Pope, from Cape Cod um, across the coastline. This is on the island sound. This is on the island. Um, archaeological records were um, sort of investigated in a way to try and figure out what sort of human activities were happening at different sites at different times, and were categorized, categorized into broad groups. So uh, there was lots of hunting at lots of different sites, and this is, this is by the way, during um, late woodland times, so about a thousand years ago. Uh, there was lots of uh, fishing and shellfish, fish use. There was, there was evidence of plant gathering, but there's very little archaeological evidence of horticultural uh, activities. So again, that's consistent with what the, these late sediment pollen data are showing us as well. What about fire? Uh, another quote from this Abrams and Noah article. Uh, and the Indians regularly use broadcast burning to clear forest undergrowth, prepare crop lands, facilitate travel, reduce vermin and weeds, increase mass production, and improve hunting opportunities by stimulating forage and driving or encircling the game. So in this case, we take advantage of another um, piece of evidence that shows up in these late sediment reports. When fires burn, they produce charcoal, and some of those little bits of charcoal end up being deposited into Lake sediments, where again we come along, pour the ponds, and can sieve these, these bits of charcoal out of the, um, out of the sediments. Uh, this is a summary of char these charcoal data from 15 sites across southern New England where we've done these types of analyses. Uh, the x axis in this case is time again, going from 12,000 years ago to the present day. The y-axis is sort of a standardized index of how much charcoal is in these cores at these different points in time. And again, this is an average value. Um, what you see is that it's highly variable through time. Uh, the highest values come after European settlement. Uh, the next highest values come between about 10 and 8,000 years ago. We've started to make sense of this messy data set by thinking about what fire is responding to. And the first thing is that comes to mind is climate. And so we are able to reconstruct moisture availability by um, essentially reconstructing changes in lake level through time. And I won't get into the methodology of that, but we can basically use evidence from lake sediment cores to determine when lakes were relatively full and when they were relatively shallow through time. So this blue line is a, is a regional summary of moisture deficit. So in other words, relatively high values mean that ponds are relatively shallow, and in turn, climate is relatively dry. Um, and so it makes good sense that as climate gets moisture, as you go from about 10 to 8,000 years ago, that there would be more burning on the landscape. Drier conditions dries out the um, vegetation, makes it prone to fire. And, and just as, as a um, quick point that I'll come back to later on, interestingly, we're in the wettest part of the last um, 12,000 years right now. There's been progressive moistening um, starting at about 10,000 years ago. Now, hopefully you're asking yourself, okay, Wyatt, what about between 10 and 12,000 years ago? It's plenty dry. Where's your fire? Well, fires need something to burn. It can't just be dry. You've got to have some biomass out there on the landscape to burn. So this is the average pollen percentage of oak at um, these same 15 sites through time. And isn't it interesting how the slope of the upslope of oak tracks the increase in fire that you see between 12 and 10,000 years ago? Uh, so I, so we've we've just recently started to, to really understand this in a way, that you need both the right type of climate and you need the right type of fuel on the landscape to burn in order to produce the charcoal that shows up in these like seven minutes. Now, again, how does this compare with people? Uh, if humans are doing a lot of broadcast burning um, to uh, facilitate travel, encourage mass species, create agricultural fields, you would expect that there would be uh, a lot of charcoal during the late archaic and late woodland times. There's a small hint of something here, but during late woodland time, which has the, the highest reconstructed values for Native American populations, there's simply no peaking charcoal, which, um, which is really quite interesting. However, 
the patterns are highly variable across sites. Uh, and I want to bring this home to you all by looking at the, some data that come from here in Redmond. So about 10 years ago, um, a group of us from the Harvard Forest collected a sediment core from Mpahuaga Pond, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it showed me on a map, reminded me on a map this afternoon that it's about three or four miles due west of here. I've added to that last slide the charcoal data from Mpahuaga Pond. Um, and very interestingly, at the time of high regional Native American populations, you see the, the uh, second highest values of charcoal at Mpahuaga Pond. Also, interestingly, is that during late woodland time, you see a, a very clear pronounced peak in charcoal um, in the sediments of Mpahuaga Pond. Uh, you also see very high values here at, at after the peak So I think this, this story as we've understood it so far is that um, fire at the scale of thousands of years is going to be controlled by climate as well as by fuel availability. Uh, but it is uh, highly variable across space and through time. And at some scales, human activities appear to be important as evidenced by this record from the of the um, I'm going to take a couple slides to, to transition now to Ed's uh, part of the talk by looking at some of the other data from a block uh, In this case, I've switched the axes so that time is on the y-axis. And in this case, the x-axis is the relative abundance of oak. So oak has always been abundant, but, but was especially so between about 9 and 4,000 years ago, at which point oak declines in abundance and um, is replaced to some extent by what we think of as more um, moisture requirement species, like peach, birch, and, and chestnut. Um, our interpretation is that the vegetation is responding to that progressive um, trend towards higher moisture that we've seen over the last 10,000 years. And that, at some point, kicks you, <coughs> kicks you out of um, this very high oak dominance to having some other species uh, more abundant. Now, I just want to highlight now that we can see the time of European settlement by this drastic increase in the abundance of gravity. Um, as well as a corresponding decrease in the amount of oak pond. So oak, oak dominated forests were cleared for agriculture, and, uh, and you see that manifest in these, in these uh, lake settlements. Now, for the next half an hour, Ed is going to focus in on this fascinating period of time in which we can look at what the vegetation was like just before European settlement by using pollen data from Umpawak as, other, other, as well as other types of data sources. And we can also look at the changes that have happened during the last 400 years, uh, during which we've had this um, really uh, amazing e ecological transformation of the landscape associated with European agriculture. Uh, uh, so I'll turn things over to Ed. Uh, we'll have question time for, for both of us at the end. Thanks. <laughs> about the landscape involved the extent to which it was open 
or forced it at the time of settlement, as White referred to as well. And the extent to which Native American activity, um, agriculture, fire, tree removal for fuel wood, um, was altering the landscape. And so, as Wyatt discussed, you know, were the impacts dramatic in altering the landscape, um, as pictured here with extensive openings and agricultural fields? Were, were they more subtle or even largely invisible in a, in a uh, wooded landscape, as pictured here? And, you know, like many ecological questions, the answer likely depends on the scale in which you're examining it, as Wyatt mentioned, and, um, and the particular location. We know that Native Americans were in Reading. Um, unfortunately, we don't have very good information on how many Native Americans were here. So, people aren't the only animal that capable of altering the landscape in dramatic ways. So, another source of chronic disturbance is this animal here, the beaver. And prior to European settlement, there were an estimated hundred, uh, several hundred million beaver in North America. And uh, you know, beaver, um, as we all know, dam streams uh, to create ponds, which provide habitat for them, protection from predators, and an additional food source. And eventually, they deplete their food source around those ponds. And uh, pond, the dam fails, the pond drains, and in its place forms this wet meadow uh, full of grasses and sedges. And these meadows can persist on the landscape for 70 years um, or even longer. And so you get a sense of just looking at the southwestern Connecticut uh, waterways, the potential for an animal to uh, this animal to have a dramatic effect on forest waterways. Uh, one source of evidence for reconstructing the pre-settlement landscape are first-hand accounts by the earliest settlers. And these, of course, can be quite powerful because these are people that were actually there looking at these. Lands. And, you know, in this case, these two quotes really reveal the importance of spatial scale. Again, if we look at the lower quote, um, the author talks about extensive uh, openings along waterways. Uh, but in the upper quote, you know, the same author from the same time period is talking about the overarching uh, dominance of forests in the landscape. So, taken in isolation, either of these quotes uh, could be misleading about the landscape as a whole. I just want to mention, um, you know, a few additional caveats about using these accounts. You know, it's really difficult to know how representative the observations of these um, these authors are um, in the broader landscape, or for a particular location like Reading. I mean, if we're talking about the New Netherlands, I mean, what is that? That's a big area. I mean, what does that what does that say about Reading in particular? We don't really know. Um, and and we don't know whether an observation from 1649, in this case, uh, how representative that is of 1600 for uh, widespread European arrival and the arrival of um, European diseases and their impacts. So the sediment record is why it introduced can be helpful in interpreting the structure of the landscape in a particular location. So pollen records, and fortunately I don't have to go into how they work because Wyatt did such a great job of already introducing that, but they roughly reveal the extent of openness of the landscape by the percentage of herb pollen. Um, and so, as Wyatt mentioned, most of southern New England at 1600 AD, most of the records, um, well I should, I should note these categories, uh, so less than or equal to 10% herb pollen is really representative of a forest landscape. Uh, 10 to 20 percent is, is um, generally reflective of a mix of forest and open vegetation, and then greater than 20 percent is this grassland meadow category. And most of the southern New England records 400 years ago uh, fall into this forest category. And as does Uncle Pond here in Reading uh, for most of the past 10,000 years. But interestingly, at 400 BP, Uncle Pond and why I showed that figure with the you know the increased fire um, jumps up into the sort of lower end of this mix of forest and vegetation category, you know, just at the lower end. And interestingly, much of the herb pollen in this 11% or so is sedge pollen, 
which you know, said is often grow in wet meadows. And so this could be an indication of beaver activity. It could be an indication of Native American fire. Um, but despite the relatively more open conditions in Reading in 1600 AD, the dominant vegetation would still have been forest. And the forest would probably have looked quite different to us, however. As this quote suggests, uh, many of the trees would have been very large and very old, maybe on the order of 200 to 400 years or older. And the forms of the trees might have looked like this, this picture from this ancient oak forest with uh, large trunks, uh, very small crowns, and a few uh, thick, twisting branches, almost reminiscent of a celery stalk. Um, you know, in sharp contrast to the smaller trunks and bigger crowns that are typically now another way the forest may have differed um, from what we're familiar with today is in the number of trees and the more open structure and the grassy understories as depicted in these quotes. Um, I had to remind myself that you know eastern New Jersey, it sounds far away, but it's you know it's only about 30 miles from Reading. So these are not too far away. Um, and this openness, and I, oh, I should note that. You know, if you're wondering what this really means, I mean, what the reference for the for that number of trees? I mean, today there are about 120 trees per acre on average in eastern New Jersey. So we're talking about a five to ten uh, fold difference. So this openness of the forest would likely have been aided by periodic fire, uh, which results in many of the attributes that these early settler early settlers uh, discuss uh, right here. And what we know from Umpawag Pond, as Wyatt mentioned, is that fire was relatively high 400 years ago, uh, about 20 times higher uh, than it was today, uh, from the sediments today, from the Umpawag Pond sediment record. So fire was likely a relatively important influence on the landscape. And consistent with an open forest structure described by the early settlers in the last slide, are relatively high levels of this, this fern, bracken fern, um, at 1600 AD, compared to essentially absent today. And bracken fern is often an indicator of recently burned woods and relatively open and thinly shaded woods. And open woodlands and fire could also have been influenced by climate. So in the second half of the 16th century, that we had this severe and sustained so-called mega drought, which is this bar right here, uh, across the eastern United States and up into southern New England, lasting for 23 years. So you know, we think of the drought we had here in 2016 or 2015, this one lasted for 23 years. Mm -hmm. um, Droughts tend to kill the largest and tallest trees, they create canopy gaps, they dry out the forest understories, and this can result in more flammable vegetation, which can enhance fire. But it's, it's important to note that not all of the pre-settlement forests were likely to have had this open structure. Wetter forests, forested wetlands, would have uh, been less affected by drought and fire, and would likely have had a relatively dense understory. Okay, so I've talked about the structure of the forest. What about the composition? What trees dominated Redding's forest at the time of settlement? And we can certainly look to the paleo record as Wyatt described uh, to some extent to answer this question, but we're fortunate to have another data source in the early land surveys. And upon settlement, colonial towns um, began the process of dividing the land up for individual property ownership. And they typically surveyed the perimeter of the land from the starting point around the perimeter back to the start uh, using trees as corner posts, as, as uh, described here in this early land grant. And ecologists and forest historians have compiled these so-called witness trees across towns, counties, and the region and uh, created this remarkable inventory of, of forest composition at the time of European summer. Okay, so what do we have here in Reading? Uh, we, set, we have white oak, was clearly the dominant tree. Uh, red oaks were common as well. This is a mix of three species. Um, so it's not as impressive as a single species here. 
Chestnut was common, but only about half as abundant as white oak. Um, that might surprise some of you who um, you may often hear that chestnut was the dominant tree in this, in this landscape or this region. Um, but this is very typical of this region, that chestnut was nowhere near as abundant as white oak. Uh, maple is a tree. I mean, if you know the woods around here, you know that red maple is very common. That was not common at all in the original forest, and hemlock did not appear at all in the, in the history. And as I said, these patterns are consistent with you know the larger region, and they really do reflect the environmental conditions in the age of the forest at the time. Hemlock and maple uh, do not like droughts; they do not like fire. Species like white oak uh, do uh, are much better adapted to those conditions. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the vegetation. I'm going to turn to some of the wildlife and. These comments will no doubt sound a familiar note to some of you who are um, here in southwestern Connecticut and, and other nearby um, areas. And if, I, if you were under the impression that high deer densities are a you know, novel condition in our woods today, this, these quotes may make you think again. And uh, if you recall those open forests and grassy and bracken fern understories that I mentioned before, certainly browsing could have contributed to those conditions as well. But in other respects, the, forest, the wildlife would seem quite different to us. Wolves howling in the woods, chasing, running down deer. Even bison, they, although they were not here in Reading, they were only about 65 miles away in northwestern uh, New Jersey at the time of the summer. Um, in addition to abundant deer, numerous wild turkeys would be very familiar to us um, in the woods. But in other respects, the bird life would be utterly foreign to us. Passenger pigeon was once the most abundant bird on Earth, uh, with an estimated three to five billion birds in the population. Um, it migrated each spring up into this core nesting territory, uh, which Connecticut is a part of. Um, it fed on acorns and beech nuts and chestnuts. And the flocks were so large that they actually were a significant disturbance to the forest canopies. The sheer weight of the birds would break branches in the canopy and they would deposit a pretty significant source of nutrients on the forest floor. Okay, so I mentioned earlier some of the caveats of using the early settler's accounts. And here's another example. And you know, really, this quote helps remind us of just how unknown the Northeast and North American landscape to Europeans in the 17th century. And remarkably, you know, 150 years later in 1801, uh, Thomas Jefferson still held out hope that Lewis and Clark would discover mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths out in the American West, even though little did they know those species had been extinct for over 10,000 years. So this species, of course, was not extinct. <laughs> um, okay, so southern New England and Reading, we've established they were predominantly a forest and landscape, even if Reading was um, uh, relatively more open than some of, the, some, some of the other areas. And when they first arrived, early settlers began process, the process of clearing the forest. Now, in some cases, they were able to take advantage of open fields cleared by the Native Americans along the coast. But as they moved inland, uh, the process of forest clearance really began in earnest. And you can see that in, by 1870, uh, Reading was only 32% forested. And these pictures are uh, from the Harvard Forest Dioramas. So if you haven't seen them up in Peter Sand Mass, I highly recommend it uh, to get a sense um, of forest history over time. But this picture here really you know, gives you a sense. I mean, it looks more like a, a, a grassland from the American West than it does an eastern deciduous forest landscape. And if we return to our graph just to convince us that the percentage of herb pollen in the, in the paleo and the sediment record uh, actually uh, works in terms of these different categories, we see that now Umbuag Pond is 36% herb pollen in the mid 19th century. And it's indeed well into this grassland and meadow category. And 
as the forests were cleared, um, there were dramatic effects on many forest animals, um, as you can see here, and a number of which remain extirpated today, including the wolf and the mountain lion, and one uh, which remains globally extinct, the Pasco Canyon, which was probably the most tragic loss uh, associated with European settlement. Um, and of course, this was more than just a habitat loss issue. This was also an unrestricted hunting issue. Uh, which led to the demise of the animals. But the figure also illustrates an important point, and that is if you drastically change the structure of the vegetation, you're going to negatively impact some animals, but you're also going to benefit others. And this is a bobolink. Um, it's been cut off here, but meadowlark is another grassland bird. Uh, many grassland species, insects, wildflowers, birds, mammals, uh, Increased dramatically as a result of this forest clearance. So, agriculture was not destined to last in this region with the rocky, nutrient poor soils, and as the West was settled, um, agriculture moved out as well to the Midwestern prairie soils, um, and widespread farm abandonment took place here in southern New England and elsewhere in the Northeast. And these abandoned farmlands turned into young, shrubby woodlands. Um, and what happened is you, you had this creation of an anomalously large amount of young forest habitat. This was not, a, you know, the, most of the, the habitat in this landscape was older forests. And what this did is it created habitat for a whole new suite of species that specialized in, in shrubby habitat, the New England cottontail. Uh, a rabbit species that's endemic to New England, uh, found only in New England. It's also endangered. And it also caused a few other species, such as the golden winged and blue winged warblers, to migrate into southern New England. These were not historically native, but they specialize in this habitat. And when we, all of these old fields and young scrubby woodlands happened, these animals came and took advantage of it. This was also a period of um, peak timber harvesting um, in the remaining woodlands and the regrowing forests. You can see right here it's, um, the, the most lumber production. So this is Connecticut, if you can't read this. And it was also a peak in fire. Um, uh, charcoal pieces at 1900 were six times more abundant than pre settlement times and over a hundred times more abundant today in the sediments at Umpawag Pond. So, in short, the landscape was really getting hammered at this time by both logging and fires, and this statistic is not surprising given, given the sheer level of disturbance. But, you know, like, like the animals that respond to these changes in habitat, there are always going to be some species that benefit from any type of disturbance regime, no matter how intensive it is. And in this case, American chestnut, um, a tremendous Sprouter at the base. It sprouts better than any other hardwood when it's cut. And this tree went from a common species in the early colonial period to the most dominant tree in Connecticut by far. And this was a direct result of all the intensive logging. Uh, so the, this age of shrubby transitional woodlands was just that. It was transitional. These are inherently unstable habitat types here in New England. Um, the, the landscape wants to self-organize in the forest, and that's exactly what it did in the, in the 20th century. This remarkable uh, return of the forest um, from agricultural abandonment. And with it were many of these forest animals that were either um, greatly um, reduced or even eliminated from the region uh, made a return. Not all of them, as I mentioned, the wolf and the mountain lion, although those of you who are familiar with the mountain lion that got hit on the Merritt Parkway, I mean, there are signs that these animals are, are on their way back. Um, and then you see what happens to the grassland species as the forests return. And here's what, Reading was no exception tremendous return of, of forest cover. Um, I should mention that the coyote was um, a new arrival 
this uh, landscape. And there were other new arrivals, and as the farms were being abandoned, our ancestors brought over us a host of, of ornamental shrubs uh, to plant in their gardens and hedgerows uh, from Eurasia. And many escaped into the countryside and began colonizing these regrowing woods. And as many of you are no doubt familiar with these plants, these plants do incredibly well at colonizing disturbed land. They're, they just thrive, and they would have thrived in that century in this heavily disturbed landscape. This is a figure of the percentage of U.S. Forest Service plots, modern day, contemporary, that have at least one invasive exotic plant in them. And it's grouped by county. And we're here in Fairfield County, of course, it's orange coated, so 56 to 80 percent of the plots have at least one invasive exotic. And so you see the extent of um, the colonization. But I would just note, however, that the impacts of non-native plants have really generally not been as severe as many people feared or predicted. And, you know, today many native birds and mammals are adapting to, and in some cases, even prefer um, invasive exotic habitat. Not all of them, and there are certainly examples where exotics do have negative effects, but there are many places where they don't as well. Um, our ancestors also inadvertently and unfortunately brought in a host of forest insects and diseases, primarily on imported nursery stock, that began to have a large effect on our forests. And these are the arrival dates in Connecticut. Most recent being the emerald ash borer, which you may have seen in the ash around the town. We certainly have it in an abundance here in the and many of you uh, know this story, I'm sure, but it's if you're giving a talk on forest history, you do have to go over it. And it's the most devastating impact of a non-native disease on our native trees, the chestnut blight uh, on American chestnut. This chestnut blight was first um, arrived or first discovered in the Bronx Zoo in 1904, imported on Asian uh, Japanese chestnut trees. It began um, in 1904, it began um, infecting the trees in the park, it soon spread, and within three or four decades, it had killed essentially every canopy chestnut across its entire Appalachian range. Um, just a shocking loss of a, one of our native trees. And the blight kills the trunk of the tree, um, but not the roots. And I mentioned how what a prolific uh, sprouter chestnut is. And so this is what happens. Chestnut sprouts back, tries to make a comeback, tries to survive. It gets to a certain height, and then it's killed again, only to sprout back again. It's this constant cycle. And so the blight has not eliminated chestnut, it's, but it's converted it from a canopy tree to an understory shrub. Okay, so um, let's look at the changes. I showed you that original graph uh, <coughs> of the witness tree data here in Reading, and now what's happened um, in the past several hundred years to the modern day, and you see some pretty impressive changes, and of course the most impressive is the chestnut, but it's by no means the only one uh, of note. I mean, look at white oak declined by fivefold red maple, but most of this is red maple, eightfold increase. It's, it's essentially replaced white oak as the dominant tree. Birch increased by fourfold. Hemlock is now, you know, a common tree. It wasn't present at all. Um, Non-natives. Interestingly, let, far less than 1% of Reddick's forest is non-natives. And this shows that the column, you know, the, the non-native of um, issue is really one in the urban shrub layer. It's really not happening nearly so much in the tree layer. And again, this has to do with changing environmental conditions. <coughs> Hemlock and maple thrive in great wetter forests, which we have today. Uh, they thrive in, in, in reduced fire environments, which we have today. Um, and then all of that colonization of man and agriculture maples and birches uh, did much better at that. Um, 
The forests that grew back were also not the same in terms of the age and structure, obviously. When you had three or four hundred year old trees in the pre settlement forest. Um, and today we've lost almost all of those, those original. It says virgin forests. These are forests never cut by Europeans. You see the extent of the loss over time. To the early 20th century, where essentially no remaining old growth forests were left in the region. Today, there's an estimated 0.04% old growth in Massachusetts. In Connecticut, um, these two stands are notable as survivors in the 20th century. This Colebrook stand was 300 acres of old growth. Picture is from 1912, and it was also logged in 1912, tragically. This was a really impressive forest. This is Cathedral Pines in Cornwall. Uh, many of you probably know what happened to that. It was blown down by a tornado in 1989. Um, most of it's gone. There's a few, a, a small remnant patch of it that you can still visit. Uh, other more other changes to the forest have been more subtle, and this is. Uh, some work by Richard Premack at Boston University, uh, working in the Concord, Massachusetts landscape. And he looked, and his colleagues looked at the first flowering date of a bunch of woodland wildflowers in Walden Pond, around Walden Pond, and compared it to uh, what Thoreau recorded in his journals in the 1850s of the same plants. And what they found is, is a 10 day earlier flowering time on average today than back in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, um, I shouldn't say of course, but it is associated with a dramatic rise in temperature in the Boston area and across much of the region and elsewhere. And it probably has to do with increased uh, um, uh, growing season uh, leading to those earlier flowering times. Okay, so um, approaching the end of my talk, but we um, this brings us to the most recent land use uh, period of this story, and this the age of reforestation that I referred to is now ending in the late 20th century. Uh, we've now entered this second deforestation, and it's often labeled as a hard deforestation because forests are being converted to parking lots and roads and buildings as opposed to agriculture meaning that the conversion is sadly more permanent um, than it was before. You can see the erosion of forests is happening here in Reading, um, as well as across New England. And this map shows um, forest fragmentation in Reading, the light green, a recent uh, fragmentation of forests over the past 20 years or so. And fragmentation, um, has a really dramatic effect on a lot of forest animals, most notably songbirds, like the wood thrush, the globally vulnerable species, uh, does a lot less well in these small forest patches. And this is because it, it's nest gets, um, there are much more, many more predators that can attack its nest, and there are also nest parasitizers, cowbirds, um, which later ends in a bird's nest in these smaller forest blocks. And a pretty shocking number of turtle species in southern New England are globally threatened with extinction. And this is very much a fragmentation effect. We know these animals are very slow dispersers. Um, when they try to cross roads, they get hit by cars. Um, people also collect them when they get out in the open as pets, and this has a big Okay, so this is, I'm going to conclude here with just a few points um, that try to tie together both talks. And you know, first, I just want to say that ecological change has really been constant over the past 12, 15,000 years and will continue to be an inescapable part of our forests in the future. So at some level, um, as stewards of the forest, we need to embrace that change. Uh, second, that nature is often more resilient than we think. Why I talked about this dramatic decline of hemlock in 5400 BP, but hemlock did eventually recover. So species uh, do recover. We, we had a forest 
dramatic forest loss, and we also have forest recovery, and we're recovering in many species. Uh, but there are limits to this resilience, as we know from the passenger pigeon, and because of this second deforestation line. And fortunately, we have groups across New England that are interested in coming together in an effort to protect the region's remaining forests with a bold um, goal of tripling the pace of land conservation in the coming decades. And we certainly hope that this goal will be realized and then we move forward. So that's all I have, and thank you very much.